This is chapter 10, reaction rates and chemical equilibrium. Section two is chemical equilibrium. So the two topics in this chapter, reaction rates and chemical equilibrium, are very closely related. There is a, a strong link between them that we'll learn about in a moment. But before we can get to that, we want to understand uh, first what a reversible reaction is, because chemical equilibrium depends on the existence of a reversible chemical reaction. So if we think about what a chemical reaction is, and I've stressed this point many times, it's just a rearrangement of atoms. Okay, You have a collection of atoms, and when you have them in the form of the reactants, they have certain bonds and a certain uh, configuration. During the course of a reaction, those bonds are broken, new bonds are formed, and the atoms reconfigure, rearrange themselves into a new arrangement. Okay, And that's the products. In principle, that process can just be completely reversed. You can take the same atoms, put them through the opposite process, back run them backwards, and turn them back into the reactants. Okay, So in principle, every chemical reaction is reversible. In practice, though, only certain reactions can actually go in both directions. Sometimes uh, a reaction will have too much of an energy requirement to go one way or another, or it'll just take too long going in one direction, or the products of the reaction going in one direction are lost, you know, it gives off a gas that escapes or something like that. Uh, and so in practice, not every reaction is really considered reversible. But some reactions are still highly reversible, and these are called, obviously, reversible reactions. So we can write a reversible reaction using this two-way arrow that you see here. Okay, an arrow pointing to the right and an arrow pointing to the left. Sometimes they're drawn as little half arrows like this, that's fine, um, but you don't want to get them confused with a double-headed arrow like this. Okay, this double-headed arrow indicates resonance in chemistry, which is a totally different uh, concept, not related to equilibrium, so we don't want to use that. Okay, use either two full arrows pointing in opposite directions, or you can use these little uh, sort of harpoon half arrows, sometimes they're called. Okay. And here we just have the reactants A and B and the products C and D. And they're separated instead of by a one-way arrow, they're separated by this two-way equilibrium arrow. To see how this works in practice, think about the example of hydrogen gas reacting with iodine gas. So hydrogen gas can react with iodine to combine together and form hydrogen iodide gas, HI. Okay? So if you put just hydrogen gas and iodine gas into a container and you leave them to react, then molecules of hydrogen will collide with molecules of iodine and they'll generate molecules of HI, hydrogen iodide. Okay? So this is the forward reaction. This is what we would normally think of as the chemical reaction when we're combining these two gases. However, you can also just put a pure sample of hydrogen iodide into a container. And if you have just hydrogen iodide in a container, two molecules of the HI can collide and then split back apart into a molecule of hydrogen gas and a molecule of iodine gas. Okay? So while we have a combination reaction here, right, the forward reaction is a combination, the reverse reaction is essentially a decomposition. Two molecules of hydrogen iodide collide and reform a molecule of hydrogen gas and a molecule of iodine gas. Okay? And so this is the reverse reaction because it's just the opposite of what happens in the first place. So when you have a reaction like this that can occur in both directions, we can condense them into a single process with this reversible arrow. Okay, So we have hydrogen plus iodine gives you hydrogen iodide, but then you also draw a back arrow to indicate that the reverse process is also possible. And so in a reaction like this, in a system where you've combined hydrogen and iodine, or maybe you've combined hydrogen iodide or some combination of these, then you're going to have both reactions occurring at the same time. Anytime you have hydrogen near iodine gas, there's the possibility that they'll react to form HI. But also, anytime you have just pure HI molecules in close proximity to one another, there's a chance that they can react to form hydrogen and iodine. And so both of these processes are going to be going on at the same time in a reversible reaction. The rate of the forward reaction, how fast the two molecules combine together to form HI, depends on the concentration of those two molecules and the concentration of hydrogen and iodine. The rate of the reverse reaction depends on the concentration of hydrogen iodide. Okay? If there's no hydrogen iodide, then there's no reverse reaction. If there's a lot of hydrogen iodide, then the reverse reaction is going to go pretty quickly because you have a high concentration. 
before we get more into that and uh, thinking about the rates of these reversible reactions, let's just uh, take another example of how you can break an equilibrium reaction or a reversible equation down into the forward and reverse. Okay, So here we see a reversible equation, which you can tell because it has the two-way arrows. So write the forward and reverse reactions for this equation. Well, the forward reaction is very easy. You just write it the same way that it's shown, but you replace it with the forward arrow. So we have methane, CH4, which is a gas, plus two moles of hydrogen sulfide gas, H2S. And these react to form carbon disulfide, which is also a gas, and four moles of hydrogen gas. Okay? So this is the forward reaction. It's the same thing you see written here, but with a forward arrow instead of the uh, reversible arrows. Okay? And then the reverse reaction is just the opposite. So we can write it the same way with an arrow pointing in the opposite direction, but usually in chemistry we always want our reaction arrows to be pointing left to right. So instead we're going to take the products and put them in front. So we're going to start with carbon disulfide gas, and that's going to react with four moles of hydrogen gas, and together these are going to turn into methane gas and two moles of hydrogen sulfide gas. Okay. So this is the reverse reaction where we've swapped the reactants and products. Together, these two equations can be written more simply in this form. So now we want to think about what actually happens to the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions as the reaction progresses. So imagine at the beginning you put in, say we're still talking about the hydrogen iodine example. So say at the beginning of the reaction, you just put in hydrogen gas and iodine gas. Okay, there's no hydrogen iodide there, so the reverse reaction is not going to occur at the beginning. Okay, if there's no hydrogen iodide, then there can be no reverse reaction. So the reverse reaction begins with a rate of zero. The forward reaction begins with a rate as high as it will be. Okay, we put in as much hydrogen iodine as will ever be in this container at the beginning, because that's all we put in. As they get used up, they're going to convert into hydrogen iodide, and their concentration is going to decrease. Okay? So whatever the initial uh, concentration was is going to impact what the initial rate was, which means that the rate will start at a high point. Then, a few seconds later, a few moments later, depending on how fast the reaction goes, uh, some of the concentration of hydrogen gas and iodine gas will be used up. Okay, So that means you're going to have a lower concentration of those two gases, which means the rate of the forward reaction is going to decrease. Correspondingly, you've now generated some of the product. right? Those hydrogen and iodine gases that you lost to, that caused the concentration to go down, they didn't just disappear, they converted into product. So that means the concentration of HI increased. You now have a little bit of HI in the flask or in the reaction vessel. And so the rate of the reverse reaction, which depends on that, is going to increase a little bit. Right? It's going to go up to here. Another moment later, some more of the reactants will have been used up. So the reactant concentration will decrease and the forward reaction will decrease. The product will be generated during that time. Right? You'll have an increased concentration of product, which means an increased rate for the reverse reaction. And so this process continues. Every time you lose some of the reactant and the rate of the forward reaction decreases, you gain some of the product and the rate of the reverse reaction increases. Okay? Lose some reactant, that decreases. Gain some product, that increases. And this continues until you get to the point where the two rates are equal. Okay? So once the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction, then you've reached equilibrium. Okay? This is actually the definition or the criteria for chemical equilibrium, when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. Once you get this, then both reaction rates become constant for the remainder of the life of the system. Okay? Unless you make some change, add or remove something to it, uh, once you've reached equilibrium, the rates are constant. Okay? The forward rate is constant, the reverse rate is a constant, and they're both equal to one another. Since the rate depends on the concentration, the forward rate depends on the concentration of reactants, and the reverse rate depends on the concentration of products, it's also sometimes useful to take a look at those concentrations over time as well. So the previous graph was showing us how the rate changed over time. 
this is going to show us how the concentration changes over time. So again, you start with the highest concentration of reactants for this particular experiment, and you begin with no products, right? You could start it at a point where you have some product, and it'll still follow the same general path. Um, but to make it a little bit easier, we're going to start with no product and some reactant. Okay? As the reactant is used up, the concentration of the reactant decreases. As the product is generated, the concentration of the product increases. Okay? But at some point, you get to this equilibrium condition where the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate. And what that means is that in a given interval of time, for every molecule of product that you create, another molecule of product is destroyed and, and reconverted back into the reactant, which means there's no more net change in the concentration of the reactants or the products. Both of them now have a constant concentration represented by this uh, flat horizontal line. Okay? So it's a flat line on the concentration curve, which means the concentration is constant. So at equilibrium, the concentration of both species is a constant because the forward rate equals the reverse rate. Keep in mind that the concentrations don't have to be equal. So in this case, we can see that this line is all the way up here, and this line is all the way down here, which means for this particular reaction, this top line, which is the product concentration, is larger than this bottom line, which is the reactant concentration. Okay? So in this particular example, our equilibrium mixture is going to have more product than reactant. Okay? Not every reaction will do that. You might have a reaction where they reach a constant state, but they never cross. Right? So you could have the product concentration increase until it reaches a steady state, and the reactant concentration decrease until it reaches a steady state, but since they don't cross, that keeps you with more reactant than product. Okay, so that's another possibility. So just keep in mind, I just want to emphasize that the rates of the forward and reverse reaction are equal at equilibrium. The concentrations of reactants and products are constant at equilibrium, but the concentrations of reactants and products are not equal necessarily at equilibrium. Okay, you can't just assume that you have equal amounts of reactant and product. Okay, there may be an imbalance. This slide depicts this process a little more concretely so we can really see what's going on. This is the same reaction between hydrogen gas and iodine gas to produce hydrogen iodide molecules. So we can see at the beginning we have four molecules of iodine plus four molecules of hydrogen. Okay? There's no hydrogen iodide present yet, so there's no reverse reaction. Okay? The, the rates of the forward and reverse reaction are shown down here as arrows. The forward reaction is very large because we have a pretty high concentration of hydrogen gas and iodine gas. The reverse reaction, though, there's no arrow at all because there is no reverse reaction yet because there's no product yet. A one minute later, you can see the stopwatch, right? One minute later, we've had some of the reaction occur. So now we only have three molecules of hydrogen left, three molecules of iodine left, and one of each has combined together to form two molecules of hydrogen iodide. Okay? So we've decreased the amount of hydrogen gas and iodine gas, so the forward reaction has gotten a little bit slower. The, the arrow has gotten smaller. But the reverse reaction has now started to grow a little bit because we have some hydrogen iodide now. Okay, so there's going to be a small reverse reaction or a slow reverse reaction at the beginning. Another minute later, we've lost another molecule of each. We only have two moles of each of the reactants, and now we have two more moles of the product. Right? And so that means the forward reaction has gotten a little slower. The reverse reaction has gotten a little bigger. Okay? And then one more minute later, we've lost one more of each. So we're down to one molecule of iodine, one molecule of hydrogen, and then the rest are all hydrogen iodide. Okay, we have six moles or six molecules of hydrogen iodide. Uh, so at this point, the forward reaction and the reverse reaction have the same lengths. The arrows are the same. Okay? So at this point, you've reached equilibrium. Because the rates are the same, you're at equilibrium, which means even if you come back several minutes later, right? until now we've just been looking every minute, now we're going to skip ahead five minutes, and we're going to see we still have the same composition. We still have one iodine, one hydrogen, and the rest are product molecules. Okay, so we have two moles of reactants, still two moles of reactants. 
six moles or six molecules of product is still six molecules of product, right? So these numbers haven't changed because once we hit equilibrium, for every product we formed, we lost a product. For every reactant we formed, we lost a reactant. So there was a balance between minute three and minute eight where it might not be the exact same hydrogen molecule, right? This hydrogen molecule is not in all likelihood the exact same molecule as that because the reaction still occurs in the molecular level and you still have product forming and, uh, and coming apart. So it's probably a different hydrogen molecule, but the overall amount is still the same. And so we can't observe any difference in the concentration when the, the net amount of each is the same. So equilibrium is a state that a system reaches when the forward reaction exactly equals the rate of the reverse reaction. So at equilibrium, the forward and reverse reactions continue at the same rate. So make sure that you understand that the reactions don't stop. You don't stop creating product. You don't stop converting product back into reactant. Both of those processes continue, but they're balanced. Okay. So the conversion of reactants into products is balanced by the conversion of products into reactants. And so because of this balance, there's no further change that you can observe in the concentrations of the reactants and products. If you actually track a single molecule over the course of this reaction or this equilibrium system, it'll form into products and form back into reactants many times over the course of a period of time, depending on how fast the reaction is. But overall, if you're looking at the large scale properties, you're not going to be able to see that because you're just going to see the net concentrations for each. Let's take a look at another example of a reversible reaction. Here we have sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen to form sulfur trioxide. So if we start with a reaction vessel that has only sulfur dioxide and oxygen in it, then over time, some of those will react to form sulfur trioxide, right? So we can see here, a few of them have reacted to form sulfur trioxide, but you still have some oxygen and some sulfur dioxide left over. And so at this point, you've reached equilibrium because the forward and reverse reactions are equal. Okay, but we could also start with a flask or a reaction vessel full of just sulfur trioxide, just the product. And again, over time, sulfur trioxide will react with itself to reform oxygen and SO2 molecules. So even if we start from this point, we would still tend back towards this equilibrium composition. Okay, so the ratio or the amount of products and reactants you have at equilibrium is completely independent of your starting point. Okay? It doesn't matter how much reactant or how much product you put into the reaction flask to begin with. By the time it reaches equilibrium, there's sort of a set ratio between the two or three or however many species you have in the equation. Okay? There's a fixed ratio, a fixed uh, proportion between them. So let's look at a few statements about equilibrium and decide whether each of them is true or false. So in the reverse reaction, products are converted back into reactants. That is true. That's the definition of the reverse reaction, products converting back into reactants. So this is a true statement. Uh, B, statement B says, at equilibrium, the forward and reverse reactions both completely stop. Okay? This is false. As I said, the reactions do not stop at equilibrium. The reactions continue at the same rate, but the rates are equal, so they're balanced, but they're not stopping. Okay. Uh, statement C says, at equilibrium, the concentrations of the reactants and products are equal. Again, this is also false. The concentrations are constant. They don't change anymore, but they're not necessarily equal. You do not necessarily have the same amount of reactant and product. In some equilibrium mixtures, you'll have more product. In some, you'll have more reactant, and that depends on the properties of the reaction you're studying. Statement D says, as the reactants are used up, the forward reaction rate decreases. Okay? So as the reactants are used up, the concentration of the reactants is going to go down, which means, yes, the forward rate is going to decrease. This is true. Okay? And E says at equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Again, this is true. This is a statement you should absolutely remember because this is the definition of chemical equilibrium.